Uh, so our first talk is by Ruskin Hartley from Dark Sky International, who will be talking about building a global coalition to defend dark and quiet skies. Well, well, thank you. Um, I am the non-astronomer and the non-attorney, so thanks for allowing me to come and participate uh, with you. Um, I'm learning a lot, um, and and that there's a. <laughs> I'm I'm learning that astronomers must have really strong stomachs to get up those twisty mountains as well. I mean that that was quite a trip yesterday, right? <laughs> So I wanted to start here. Like, no, no one in this room needs to be told that the Earth is 4.5 billion years, plus or minus 50 years, 50 million years. And it has clearly been through a lot of changes over the last 4.5 billion years. Um, but there have been some constants. Probably in a room full of physicists, you'll probably th throw out constants like gravity and stuff like that. Um, one of the constants has been the day-night cycle, right? this 24-hour cycle or thereabouts 24-hour cycle of bright days, dark, dark evenings. And it's changed a little bit now, right? <laughs> like, how, how did we get here? And, and what does it mean for the future, right? This is Las Vegas, one of the brightest spots on the planet, a kind of fun place to go. It's perpetually time to go out for a party in the evening, right? And I think most people recognize this as pollution, right? We, we've been trained like a, a smokestack is the symbol of a warming planet, of a burning climate. And I just reading September was off the charts hot from a climate change perspective. But I don't think most people recognize lights burning all night as another direct source of pollution as well. And I, I, I I, I, since I'm a conservationist, I just wanted to just drop a few slides in, like, who's out at night, right? This guy's out. 90% of amphibians are active at night. 69% of mammals are active at night. 60% of invertebrates, that's bugs and things, like those giant cockroaches that are flying around that we wish weren't active at night, they're active at night. 30% of birds are active at night. So like the, the nighttime environment is a really critical part of the habitat of our Earth. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is just to say more and more my organization, formerly the International Dark Sky Association, now Dark Sky International, is we came from astronomers. We have one foot firmly grounded in the astronomical community, both professional and amateur that more and more what we want to do is elevate the other reasons that we should care about protecting dark skies, protecting dark places, reducing mitigating light pollution. The impact on biodiversity is tremendous. The wasted energy, some work I did with Alejandro Sanchez, maybe $50 billion a year has been wasted by the light that's just being measured by the satellites, which is a fraction of the wasted light. We're learning more and more about public health and equity, and you know, how it's impacting our literally our own bodies, our health, impact on diabetes, mental health, various forms of cancer, and set that against a backdrop that it's growing, we now know, 10% per year over the last decade. It is, in a sense, out of control. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we did a number of years ago come up with some principles that we believe offer at least a top level framework to deal with light at night. And critically, this is not about turning off all the lights all the time and plunging us into medieval darkness. It's thinking about how we can use that technology to meet our needs, apply these principles, and mitigate the impact, reduce the impact, and make sure that it's meeting our needs. And I think that sort of framework is a lot of the framework that you are discussing here. Like, how can we, we're not against satellites, right? We, we use them every single day but we want to do it in a way that is responsible that actually mitigates the impact on the environment. So we, we are having, I think we're all having our hands full dealing with ground-based light pollution, right? You know, we hadn't, had, we, we had no way got a handle on it, and then this happened, right? Starlink happened, I think it took many of us by surprise. We knew satellites were up there, we knew they were visible, and then there was this aha or oh expletive moment, what does this mean for the future? 
uh, our organization did come up with some top line principles. I've put them here because I know the slides will be shared. And, and critically, I, I mean, I think it, we were maybe lucky or maybe present, we captured a couple of the concepts that are starting to come through from the monitoring world. Like, yeah, they should be, inv they should be invisible to the unaided eye. Right, that works for humans. It turns out it works for Vera Rubin. It doesn't by no means mitigate all of the impact. Uh, and critically, we, we believe that we should maintain natural sky brightness below the level that was established by the International Astronomy Union. This 10% threshold, right? Let's not blow through that threshold through all the, the junk that we're going to leave up there if we're not c careful. Um, and you no, know, visibility should be unusual. I mean, all of us, I bet as we were kids, or we've maybe taken our kids out that we've pointed out a satellite going past and with a size source of wonder. We want it to continue to be a source of wonder and not become the wallpaper. So I, I reworked my presentation based upon some of the discussions we've had. And it's clear there's a lot of interest in terms of what we're doing in terms of our short-term response. What's our short-term policy? It's great to have all this discussion about law. Law also involves through the careful application of lawsuits, right? Any attorney will tell you that. Law is not static. It just doesn't live in a vacuum. There are attorneys arguing their interpretation of the law that then becomes the norm, as it were. And again, I'm not an attorney, so apologies if I'm getting all this wrong. So we did file a short-term response for this, an emergency action, in a sense, when SpaceX filed its second filing, and we brought a case in the second district, third district court of appeals in the United States of America against the Federal Communications Commission who is responsible for permitting that launch, right? And this is a case under the National Environmental Policy Act, essentially. This is all about administrative procedures. This is not a case about space law. It's not a case about international law. It's not a case about the Outer Space Treaty. It's about do existing environmental laws in the United States apply to activities that are occurring in low Earth orbit. The Environmental Quality Act of 1970, signed into law by Richard Nixon, um, is really the foundation for this. Uh, it established the White House Council for Environmental Quality, and essentially it, it's a public process act. It doesn't require that an agency chooses the least damaging path or action, but it does require any agency to consider the environmental impacts of its decisions and justify those and do it in public so we can have a public conversation with the tribes, with the effective parties. It left each agency critically to establish its own regulations to implement it. Um, there's a wonderful citizen's guide. It's about having your voice heard, right? It's an incredible act. Um, there are basically three types of environmental review that can occur. There's a categorical exclusion, there's an environmental assessment, and at the far end is an environmental impact statement. I'm going to focus on the categorical exclusion, and this is straight from the Federal Communications Commission's website. Categorical exclusions are for actions or types of actions which individually or cumulatively are deemed to have minimal or no impact on the environment. Therefore, they're excluded from detailed environmental review. The Federal Communications Commission has a long history of saying all of its actions are categorically exempt. And occasionally they've had to go to law, the, go to law and they've certain categories around bird issues and things have, ha, have been, um, they've had to go to do the environmental review on it. So the question is, is launching 30,000 satellites or 7,500 satellites going to have an impact on the environment, I'm not saying is low Earth orbit part of the human environment. Is it going to have an impact on our environment here in the United States? I'm not in the United States, but if I'm standing in the United States, is it going to have an impact? Is it going to have an impact on your astronomical telescopes? Is it going to have an impact on um, wildlife, on fauna, on humans? That's what it's meant to analyze. The Federal Communications Committee did a review, said, no, we don't have to go further. That's what we're challenging here. Um, part of my background, I did an environmental review. I did a, a visual resource assessment to take down a 150-foot high uh, smokestack in Morrow Bay and replace it with a 30-foot high smokestack with a new gas-fired power station. 
that action went through environmental review to take down a very big smokestack and put in a little smokestack. We had to do a visual resource assessment on that action. The Federal Communications Commission has decided, oh, we can launch 7,500 satellites and cumulatively maybe 400,000. It's not going to have any impact on anything happening here on Earth. I'll leave you to decide whether that's a reasonable argument. Ultimately, that is the argument that will be tested in court as we, as we have oral hearings on November 20th. But it's clear <laughs> we do not want to be playing whack-a-mole on this, right? <laughs> we don't want to be playing whack-a-mole. We need to work to build a broader coalition. I'm going to touch briefly on this because we're right at the start of this. All I'll comment is there's a lot of great astronomers in this room. We had heard from some wonderful indigenous perspectives earlier this week. There's some great policymakers. Think about who is not in this room. <laughs> Most of the people in the world are not represented in this group, right? So how do we build a longer coalition? I think really our focus has to be on the environmental impact of these activities. This was a paper by one of our board members, Kevin Gaston, building on the work that Aaron and others did, looking at the impact of uh, these operations in space all the way from the prop, uh, preparation cycle to decommissioning, look at all the various impacts there. Clearly there's a tremendous range of impacts that are very foreseeable. Uh, they may have an impact on the environment here on Earth, which is the threshold for a, a NEPA case there. Clearly, I think that's a very clear, becoming clearer and clearer every day. I also wanted to touch on the impact of non-ionizing radiation. There's a lot of, dis I'm fascinated by the discussions were the radio astronomers, well, we have gone from a time where we had quiet skies for everyone, where we are bathing the entire environment <laughs> in diffuse, non-ionizing radiations, and we occasionally get this big blast, right, when a satellite downlink comes up. It's very similar to light pollution. We are bathing the whole world in light pollution, and increasingly we get a shot of glare. Increasingly, there is evidence coming from the scientific literature that it's impacting bee colonies, bird migration, seed propagation. That's in the early phases, and we just started to look into this, but I think we need to reach out to those other communities. Who are those other allies? So I think the challenge here is, oh, maybe one example of the challenge. This is a, a comment letter submitted by two people who should be our allies, I believe, Wilderness Watch and the Public in, uh, Employees for Environmental Responsibility in the US for a proposal to establish a 5G cell phone service in national parks. And part of that argument is, well, you don't need to do that because guess what? We're just gonna meet all our needs from, from satellites, so don't bother putting them in there. So they're not aware of the impact that these satellites, these natural allies aren't with us yet. Um, my mum sent me these on the first day, wonderful. Astronomers sound the alarm over light pollution from new satellites, and then later, oh, discovery of jumbo, and it's wonderful news from um, James Webb. What's the takeaway from the public? Astronomy is fine. You just send a six meter telescope to the Lagrange point and problem solved. So we're sending mixed messages here, or if you do some research, SpaceX signs an agreement with the US National Science Foundation to prevent starlight's interference with astronomy. That's the message that's out there. This problem is solved, science is going on, look the other way. Unless you happen to live in some of the places that can't look the other way, like Boca Chico. <clears throat> I think part of our challenge is the light bulb is literally the symbol of innovation. Satellites represent progress. So how do we reframe this? How do we reframe this narrative? How do we reframe it so we're for something? Here. I don't have any answers on this, but we're starting that journey. It's on to look how we can bring others into more of an advocacy-focused community. How can we bring these groups in? How can we build a broader coalition that understands the whole life cycle impacts of what we are on the verge of, which is really the industrialization of space as we know it, with untold consequences? I think we all know, we're all aware of what happened with plastics in the ocean, right? We, None of us have probably seen the gyre, but we're all concerned <laughs> about that, right? And, and, and so how can we have that sort of moment here? And, and can, how can we have the foresight so we're not dealing with fixing trashed orbits that mean we can no longer see and birds can't migrate and we're dealing with all those, those impacts? Can we, can we be smart enough to come together 
as a broader community and shape that future. So we'd be looking at developing high-level principles, a roadmap, feasibility of building a global coalition that really build, reaches out far beyond the astronomy community here in sort of key or inclusive messages. And again, we're really at the early phases of this, and we look forward to sharing more of this develops. So thank you. Maybe one quick question. Any questions? Uh, thank, thanks very much, Ruskin. Great talk. Uh, Fred Watson, Australian government. Um, so th what you've just described at the end of your talk there, is there a danger that this is going to be doubling up with the work of the, of the IAU CPS? That, that's a great question, one we have got. And I, and I think what you'll see if you looked at it, there are certainly lots of overlaps. So Aparna is part of both. Um, and I, I think what we need to do, we, we need to be coordinated but there are things we can say that you will not say, right? We can take messages out and we can advocate for them. Potentially, we can litigate some of those, things that a consensus group like this that is working collaboratively industry, which is absolutely the right thing to do, will not do. But I, I think part of the message Project Westward, West Ford, the astronomers, but there was public outrage about what was... We do not have public outrage yet, and I, I'm sorry, we have... Please don't take this the wrong way. Astronomers are scientists. They are a cautious bunch, right? The professionals are a cautious bunch. The amateurs like to hang out at night with expensive telescopes on their own. They're not naturally social animals who are going to go out there <laughs> and like shout this from the rooftops and build that. And I think that's what we need. Now, now whether we can get that, I don't know. But I, I think that's what we need. Yeah, we need to be coordinated that we need an advocacy voice to carry this message forward. Thanks, Fred. Okay.